Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so we have a diversity of backgrounds and knowledge um, represented in the audience. Um, could you start us off with explaining? We have biologists have been able to change genomes for going on actually more than 30 years. What is it about CRISPR compared to both the original traditional recombinant DNA and then the more recent talons and zinc fingers mm -hmm. that just puts it, we think, head and shoulders above what has come before? Sure. Um, so CRISPR is a genome editing technology, and, and you may be wondering, what is genome editing? Um, so about 10 years ago, a little more than that, uh, we completed the first human genome. So we know every single letter uh, in the DNA of our cells. And with that, uh, we identified uh, disease-causing mutations uh, or even um, beneficial uh, mutations that reduce disease risk. So one uh, really tantalizing thought is if we know what are the bad and the good changes, why don't we just go into the cells and be able to tweak those letters in our DNA and then um, have health benefits um, um, sort of put into our cells? <clears throat> CRISPR is a way to do that. Um, there have been several methods developed before. Uh, so there's something called zinc finger and, and talons uh, and even the original recombination-based method, but they are difficult to, to use. Uh, the genome has three billion letters long. And in order for us to make a very precise tweak, change a single letter, we need to be able to program these uh, systems to go in and, and recognize a specific uh, place in the genome. CRISPR makes it possible to do that. Um, it, you can think of it as, as like a search and replace function in Microsoft Word, where you give it a search string uh, of the sequence you're trying to find in the genome in the form of a small RNA. And um, an enzyme, a protein called Cas9, will take this search string and it will search along the genome and find and, and latch onto uh, the right location. When it's there, this protein called Cas9 will make a double-stranded cut in the DNA. DNA has two strands, so it makes a cut. And that cut is like the cursor in Microsoft Word. So wherever you place the cursor, that's where you can backspace the, backspace the delete things or type in the, the new um, information. And so that's what Cas9 uh, and, and CRISPR does. Uh, it makes it possible to easily search and replace uh, sequences in the genome. So the key papers um, that brought us to this point in CRISPR appeared only in 2012 and then your own in 2013. Um, in just those short years, um, tell us, if you would, a few of the key accomplishments of CRISPR, either in terms of elucidating a basic principle or fact of biology or in demonstrating the possibility of therapeutic uses. What are some of your favorites? Um, there, there are a lot of uh, very rapid progress that have been made uh, in, in the CRISPR field. Um, so CRISPR is a bacterial system, so one of the major things to, uh, questions to answer is, does this system uh, work outside of bacterial cells? Can you use it to edit the DNA in a human cell? And so that was um, some of the, the very original work that, that we did. And then since then, uh, many labs have used it to treat uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy in a mouse, uh, develop ways to use it to treat cancer, by engineering um, uh, blood um, stem cells or by engineering T cells. Um, and there are also folks who have used to engineer uh, mushrooms that doesn't brown or other types of uh, crop species that have improved uh, sustainable properties, uh, use less water, uh, able to uh, be able to um, grow in, in um, sort of drought or, or uh, freezing temperature resistant conditions. Um, and also um, is making a lot of uh, uh, advances in, in research and development. Uh, CRISPR makes it much faster to be able to, uh, to design a, a new experiment and to uh, do that experiment and collect data. Uh, it used to take maybe uh, six months to a year to make a transgenic mouse. Now you can do it in three weeks. So that type of acceleration uh, in research and, and, and development uh, is making um, huge impacts uh, around the world. So definitely mushrooms that don't brown and the possibility of curing um, Duchenne's are reasons for um, excitement. Um, I, one also reads, however, um, that CRISPR has the potential to cure virtually every disease, um, that it will give humans control over their own evolution um, and perhaps bring back mammoths and allow us to create unicorns. So I just wish to say on behalf of the journalists here that those last ones came from scientists and not from reporters. So my question to Fung is, uh -huh. um, do you think we have reached or are we approaching a point where reasonable optimism about what CRISPR can do has already jumped into hype? 
Um, well, in, in some of these examples, we certainly are getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, you know, uh, CRISPR, um, at the most fundamental level, is, is a really exciting research technology. It makes it possible for us to understand biology. Biology is enormously complicated. Uh, we're only starting to understand what some genes do. And we really are only beginning to understand what gene, how genes interact. And as you can imagine, with 20,000 plus genes in the genome, the number of interactions um, is really enormous. It's very complicated. And so um, we're, we're not there yet to, to all, do all those really fancy things like resurrecting um, you know, extinct life and, and engineering myth, uh, mystical creatures. Um, but um, <clears throat> what we are able to do is to use it to understand biology, to push our science and understanding forward, understand disease mechanisms so that we can build drugs more rationally uh, based on what is actually causing uh, those diseases. And I think that's what we, that's what we are able to do now, and, and, uh, and there's still a lot to do, even with just that. So one of the practical obstacles or potential obstacles uh, to, to CRISPR achieving its full potential mm -hmm. um, is what are called off-target effects. As you described, it's a pretty precise system to find exactly the part of the genome that you want to change mm -hmm. and make the change that you want. Um, but there are, it turns out, some parts of the genome that are similar to others. Um, mm -hmm. And experiments have already shown that there are these so-called off-target effects. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a paper just a, a week or so ago um, claiming that off-target effects are just off the chart, um, hundreds in a mouse experiment. Um, I'm happy to hear you talk about that particular paper, but more generally, if you could just address how serious a problem you think the off-target effects are and whether there is a clear path toward overcoming it. Um, that's a really good point. Um, so the specificity or the precision with which you can use CRISPR to make a change in the genome is a very important issue. And we have known since some of the very early work on CRISPR in human cells um, that CRISPR can sometimes introduce an undesired uh, mutation somewhere else, uh, in addition to making the one that you want to make. And a lot of work has gone into developing both new systems of CRISPR by making small tweaks and, and optimizing the enzymes, the proteins, so that they are more precise, and also developing systems to help detect the presence of these unwanted, uh, non-specific uh, mutations. Both of these uh, were making a lot of progress. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, my group and also another group have engineered Cas9 to a level where we really don't detect off-target mutagenesis. Now, there is this paper that came out uh, maybe last week or a couple of weeks ago um, that suggests that there may be thousands of unwanted mutations, um, but uh, that's something that we have not seen and also many labs have not seen. And it seems that maybe some of the controls um, that they are using to, to infer those unwanted mutations uh, may not be the best one to use. Uh, it's, it's from a different, um, different strain of mice uh, than the one where they did actual experiment. So, so you can't really confidently call uh, those um, are unwanted CRISPR-induced mutations. Um, so there's still work to do to really thoroughly characterize each CRISPR uh, reagent that, that we use to make a genetic change in the cell. Um, but we are making a pretty good progress. And, and uh, for some of the, the most advanced generation of the technology, uh, I think they are quite specific. I could monopolize all of Fung's time, but um, I, I'm going to leave time for questions um, at the end if you want to start formulating some. Um, before we get to audience questions, though, Fung, um, there exist at least three companies that um, arose specifically to use CRISPR um, therapeutically, mm -hmm. they and everyone else hopes. You are a co-founder of one of them, Editas Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that the companies see um, in this that uh, accounts for their existence, their valuation? Um, and if you could tag on to the end of that um, thought, um, you just recently started um, another company, Arbor Biotechnologies. Um, so if you could also tell us what you're hoping to accomplish there. Mm. Um, well, so, so we, um, so me and George Church and uh, Keith Zhang and David and Jennifer Downer, we co-founded Editas uh, back in 2013. Uh, the idea is uh, one of the really exciting potential of CRISPR is to use it to treat genetic disease. 
Now, none of us are uh, doing clinical trials in our labs, and, and we don't have the resources uh, to be able to do very careful drug development. And, uh, and so we formed Editas uh, to take uh, the CRISPR technology to the next level, to be able to translate it into the real world so that uh, it has the potential to, uh, to help patients who have these diseases that are really untreatable today. Uh, so that's, that's what um, the mission of Editas is. And I think the other um, companies also share the same vision, which is we want to turn this into a thing that really positively impacts people's lives. Um, Arbor is, is something new, uh, something that we're really excited about. We'll have a, a really fantastic group of investors. We'll have Arch Venture uh, and also Faraden, uh, a, a venture fund uh, in New York investing in us. And also um, we have uh, David Walt, who is a, a very, re really brilliant and very thoughtful entrepreneur, uh, me. And then, um, and then I think we're very lucky to have two of my former uh, graduate students, Winston Yan and uh, David Scott, um, working uh, at Arbor. So we're very excited about um, sort of building an a exciting uh, biotechnology company. And what, what products or um, processes does Arbor hope to or intend to produce? Um, Arbor is still very early, so we're uh, still working through some of those uh, things, and uh, uh, we'll have more information okay. uh, soon. So um, if there are any questions on either the science, the, the business, we didn't even get to touch on the ethics yet, um, but please just indicate that you have a question, and there is one with a microphone there. Sir. Hi, thank you. Uh, Rodrigo Martinez with Veritas Genetics. Thank you, Dr. Shang, as always. Sure. Interesting. So there seems to be this threshold between treatment and enhancement that creates always interesting discussion. So my question would be, um, if possible at the right time, you could use CRISPR to enhance one of your senses, eyesight, smell, you know, taste. Would you do it? Why, why not? Would I do it personally? Or <laughs> well, so, so CRISPR, um, CRISPR is, is a technology um, that uh, allows us to make changes to, uh, to DNA in cells. And um, so that's only part of the, the thing. Um, what, what's missing is knowing what kind of changes to, to make. I think we're still um, in the very beginning of understanding how the genetic composition and how different mutations um, are able to sort of produce these kinds of changes or, or enhancements or, or so forth in the body. So we're, we're not quite there yet. But eventually maybe we will get there, but that could be a very long time from now. And at that point, I think we'll, we'll really have to think about as a society um, what is the best way to, to go about doing that? I think people will start to do it once the technology is safe and, and, uh, and, and we know that it doesn't cause unwanted um, uh, defects. Um, and at that point, uh, we really, really need to think about, um, you know, what is, uh, how do we do this uh, so that, um, you know, it, it's doing the right thing for society and that society can progress um, properly um, with equality and, and, um, and, and proper ethics uh, to, to support these things. It will probably happen eventually, but the ethical questions around it, I think, is complicated. And, uh, and, and those are things that, uh, fortunately, we still have time uh, to, to sort that out. So you, you would or you wouldn't? Um, um, <laughs> I think if there's something that improves my eyesight so that I can see better, I wear spectacles right now. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind um, having some therapy that would allow me, me to, to see uh, better. Um, Certainly, as long as it's safe and, and it can be done uh, in, in a sensible, uh, proper, ethical way. Other questions? Let me just inject one then. Um, so the IP situation surrounding CRISPR is um, complicated, um, and you're certainly not in charge of determining the Broad's um, licensing policy, etc. but since you are here and the general counsel and tech transfer officers are not, um, you get to <laughs> field the question. Um, um, does, d tell us what, you would, what the thinking has been um, in terms of making CRISPR available both to um, uh, nonprofit academic research um, for those purposes, as opposed to um, commercial for-profit entities, and why you think that, because I think you do think that's a reasonable way to get the technology out there as quickly as possible. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> I, I don't make these licensing decisions and, and set the policies, but um, what, what I did share with them is that um, CRISPR is a funda foundational technology, and it's something that is important to make sure that everybody have access to. Uh, imagine if 
um, the programming language for um, you know Java or Python or or uh, or Ruby are proprietary, then we it will be very difficult for the web um, products to really take off and have so many wonderful tools uh, that make our, our daily pro productivity uh, easier. So CRISPR is very much like that. It's a foundational tool. And so, so then uh, for us, what we have done is we made the tool available to the research community, um, to, to anybody who wants to use it for um, studying plants, to, to animals, to, to different kinds of diseases. And commercially, uh, the Broad Institute have adopted a policy where um, they provide non-exclusive non licenses uh, to companies that want to use CRISPR for developing different things. And then um, in the context of therapeutics, uh, they have granted um, sort of limited exclusive license. If CRISPR becomes the drug itself, then um, to justify and, and to make it possible for people to invest enough money to turn it into a, a real drug, um, they have granted limited exclusivity. And, uh, and so, so that applies to all, all these different CRISPR uh, products. And, uh, and as um, products um, that are being worked on in one company uh, continue to be developed, and if there are other things that are not being developed uh, by that company, then there could be third parties that come through and get access to, uh, to develop those additional things. So overall, um, I think the bro strategy has been to really make it possible so that um, as much of the potential of this technology uh, gets developed as possible. Right. And do I re recall correctly that one of the uh, conditions of the licensing is not germline editing? Or mm. So that this, the, so the question that before sort of opened the door. Um, we don't have a ton of time left for a very complicated question, but if you could just talk a little bit about what might be possible mm -hmm. with germline editing, um, and then if you want to at the end offer your own thoughts on whether that would be a good thing for society or for individuals. Yeah, so, um, so germline editing um, is, so uh, there's, first of all, germline editing research, and then there is germline editing uh, as a therapeutic. Uh, germline editing research is being done on animals all the time. We make mouse models, we make rat models, transgenic monkey models even, uh, and, and these are sort of making better and more precise models to understand disease very, very well, and to be able to develop drugs based on those more accurate models. Um, and then there's the, the germline editing for a therapeutic use. Um, there, um, the technology is really um, not mature to, to do that. Um, it's, first of all, um, we were not at a sufficiently high efficiency level um, to really know that we're making the, the, correct, uh, correct, uh, the correct change in the cell. And also, um, because there's the potential for off-target activity, uh, we don't have a good way to be able to verify that. Uh, in the in the edited embryo, um, the current methods for verifying genetic changes uh, is destructive. So once you have an embryo, you you check it. The, the end, you have to destroy the embryo to to check it. So so um, overall, both the CRISPR technology itself and also all of the supportive technology to be able to do the quality control and and the verification uh, is is not quite there yet. So uh, in terms of treating diseases through germline editing. We're not quite there yet, but but technology will progress, and uh, and eventually maybe we will uh, get to a stage, and and, and then um, um, I think we'll be in a much better position to to apply it. Well, thank you for your thoughts on a broad range of things, and please join me in thanking Fung. Thank you.